This is Mr. Purcell and College Algebra, and today we're going to be continuing our discussion of functions. The last time we defined a function as a rule which assigns to each x value one and only one, or exactly one y value. The key thing you need to remember for today is each function can have only one y value. We work with some function notation and so forth, and first thing we're going to do today is look at functions that are broken up into pieces. These are called piecewise functions. Now I'm printing out the assignment, so here's an example of a piecewise function. Oh, it says spring 2014. Don't let that worry y'all. It's really 2015. Okay. Okay. This is a piecewise function, and the instructions say it's a piecewise linear function. Linear means there's no exponents, and there's no exponents in it. We were doing some function notation the last time, and do y'all remember what this F parentheses negative 3 means? It means take the negative 3 and plug it in for X. <coughs> the number inside the parentheses is the X, your answer, once you plug it in, that's the y. Remember, for every x, there can be only one y value. So on this particular one, when it asks, okay, find f of negative 3, let's look at this function. This function has two pieces. f of x is 2x if x is less than or equal to 2. f of x is x minus 2 if x is greater than or equal, uh, greater than, excuse me, less than or equal to negative 2, x minus 2 if x is greater than negative 2. You can't plug this negative 3 into both of those, because if you do, you're going to have two different y values. For each function, there can be only one y value. <coughs> so what you're going to have to do is ask yourself, here's your x. Is your x less than or equal to negative 2, or is it bigger than negative 2? That's how you decide which one of these you plug it into. Your negative 3, there's your x value. Is it less than negative 2 or bigger than negative 2? Less than. Less than. So you're going to plug it into this first one. 2 times a negative 3 is a negative 6. So you'll type negative 6 in right there. When working with this function notation, you can't just plug this into every one of the x's, because if you do, you'll get more than one y value. For every x, there can be only one y value. You'll see how I'm deciding. You look at this number in here. Hmm, there's my x. It's negative 2. Is my x value less than or equal to negative 2, or is it bigger than negative 2? Well, it's, it's equal, right? So it's less, you use the same one you just used, the less than or equal. So you plug in here. What number am I going to put in as my answer? 2 times a negative 2, negative 4? So before you just plug in, the last time we had some function problems, we were just taking the x, plugging it in. The function was only one piece, not two or three. For these piecewise, you've got to decide which one do you plug into. Up here. The next one. The x is zero. So is zero less than negative two or bigger than negative two? It should not equal something. Bigger. So you're going to plug in t here to the bottom one. Zero minus two, negative two. Is this orange invisible today or not? Let's see. Visible today. Okay. Y'all caught up? Before you decide, before you just plug in for x, You've got to decide which one do you plug it into. Like when you plug the 2 in for x, if you plug it into this one, you get a 4. If you plug it into this one, you get a 0. 
You know if this were a multiple choice test, one of the wrong answers would be a 4. Well, I've told you what the right answer is. Here the x value is 2. It's bigger than negative 2. Our x value is bigger than negative 2. So we plug it into that bottom one, x minus 2. So 0 is what goes there. And what about our last one? I'll give you a multiple choice, just two choices. It's either 10 or 3. Which one is it? Three. What my math lab, Pearson, they're working on is getting in that writing and reading component. So in a few years, once you find three, it's going to ask, okay, um, why? Why is it that one and not, why didn't you plug into the other one? And then there'll be all these little paragraphs written out that you've got to choose. The rich one is saying, but the x value is bigger than negative 2. That's why you're using the x minus 2. So what do y'all say? 3 for that one? I'll just write 3. So this was a function that was broken into two pieces. And it's called a piecewise function. Just some notation or terminology. So the, the top part of 2x is a piecewise function? Well, the whole thing. It's broken. f is okay. two pieces. Okay, so the whole thing is a piecewise function. Like number three, excuse me, number two, the next one we're about to do, how many pieces is it broken into? Three. 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 Okay. So... Mm -hmm. a moment. I notice sometimes I'm moving too fast when I'm recording this because I don't have to write the problem down. It's already there. You know what? Maybe I'm going to write it in a... I'm going to rewrite the problem so it's in a color world rather than a black and white. So we'll have the blue piece, the pink piece, And the purple piece. And I'll tell those colors. Okay. Now I'll certainly be using those colors. I'll be rewriting it with colors when I'm graphing this stuff, which is what we're working up to. Well. The next thing we're going to do is going to graph, be graphed one of these. So, on the first one, to find f of negative 2, you look at the number in the parentheses, that's your x. And you've got to ask yourself, is your x value less than 2? This statement right here, 2 less than, or less than x, less than 9, when you see something like that with two less thans or two greater thans, a compound inequality like that, the easiest way to read it is using the word between. We're going to use the pink rule 3x if x is between 2 and 9. We'll use the purple rule 4x minus 5 if x is greater than or equal to 9. So here's our x value. Where is it? Is it less than 2, between 2 and 9, or bigger than 9? It's less than 2. So we're going to plug into the blue one, 3 minus 5x. So I'll go 3 minus 5 times negative 2. I'm using parentheses for the times. So what's that going to be? It's going to be a 3 plus 10. The number I type into the little box for the y value, will that be 13? If we can judge the future by the repeated past on the second test, there's always a problem like this one here, where there's three pieces, and then you're given some number. Find f of something. Could y'all imagine what sort of wrong answer choices would be listed there? 
Could y'all tell me a wrong answer that you know the software is going to program as one of the answer choices? Like if it said find f and negative 2. 13 is the right answer. Negative 6. If you plug the negative 2 here, you get negative 6. That would be wrong. <coughs> what if we plugged it into the purple one? 4 times negative 2 is negative 8 plus 5, negative 3. See, there's, and then be, to get a part D, there'll just be a random number. But I remember one semester a student came up, she was real nice, and said, all three of the numbers up there, which one do you want me to choose? I was like, that's part of the problem. You're supposed to know which one. Remember? And I'm pointing to the ear. Remember? You're supposed to know. Which is, oh. And I don't remember if she got it right or not. I don't remember if she remembered or what that O meant. But she said, oh. So let's move on to the next one. Find f of 1. Hmm. Is our x value less than 2, between 2 and 9, or bigger than 9? Less than 2. So we're still using that first rule. I'm afraid that these might be programmed to go in the order. First one, second one, third one. That's sort of unfortunate. So plug in a 2 in right here. Excuse me, plug in a 1 in to the blue x. The 5 times 1 is just 5, so we have 3 minus 5, negative 2. For the next one, find f of 3. Hmm. Is our x value 3 less than 2, between 2 and 9, or greater than or equal to 9? Between the 2 and the 9. So we're going to plug into the pink. 3 times 3. Here I'll just use the little star for times. And 9. What about the next one? Find f of 7. It's still between 2 and 9. The x value is still between 2 and 9. So what number will I type in there for that one? 21? Mm-hmm. 3 times 7, 21, and finally the last one, find f of 9, well is our x value, yeah it's greater than or equal to 9, if this number were 9 or anything bigger than 9, like 10, 11, 100, you plug into that last one, so 4, times 9 plus 5. 4 times 9 is 36 plus 5. Is that going to be a 41? Okay. Any questions there? graph one of these and for graphing them I really like to use the different colors and so just like I did with number two I'm going to rewrite it with a lot of different colors this is going to be problem number six and I don't want to show the answer choices right off again these are some when you print these the graphs look so small but if you uh, Okay, so we're going to graph this function, and I guess I could just do this, rather than recopying it. The first one's going to be the blue one, the 3 plus 2x. The second piece, the negative 2x, that's going to be the pink one. And the third piece, I'm just color coding it, 
the purple. Okay? I have this bizarre desire to give things names. That if you look at my math, they won't give names. So cut point method, they never say the phrase cut point. It's just numbers they're plotting on the number line and so forth. Keeping in mind my desire to give things names, I like to call the numbers over here on the right, the stuff with the if, cut points. Why am I calling them that? Well, because they behave a lot like cut points when we were solving inequalities. When we're graphing them, you're going to see they behave like cut points. But also, it's where we're cutting the graph. We're going from the blue rule to the pink rule to the purple rule. Okay, so these numbers to the left, excuse me, on the right, like these here, 2 and 9, I call those cut points. To graph this, I've already set up a rectangular coordinate system that I'm going to be using. And... graph these, you'd start off by locating these cut points on the x-axis. Locate those numbers on the x-axis. We have two cut points, negative 4 and what other number appears over there after the ifs? The number 5. So locate negative 4 and positive 5 on the x-axis. <coughs> and in this graph, we're going to have a blue piece, a pink piece, and a purple piece. I'll pick on the pink piece first, because if you remember how I said to read, if you have two less thans or two greater thans, read those between. The pink graph is going to be where? Between negative 4 and 5. So between negative 4 and 5, that's where we're going to have this pink graph drawn. So up here between those, I'm going to go ahead and write y equals negative 2x. And I'm going to draw a little xy table because that's how we're going to graph these. Now, the pink graph is between negative 4 and 5. Where's the blue graph? This first one, the 3 <coughs> plus 2x, where does it go and where does the 2x, the purple graph, go? Well, the blue graph is going to be drawn for x's less than negative 4. Well, would that be to the left of negative 4? Yeah. So to the left of negative 4, I'm going to graph y equals 3 plus 2x. And I'll draw my little XY table. And finally, the purple graph, the 2X. <coughs> purple graph is going to be drawn for X is greater than 5. Well, to the left of 4, we have, negative 4, we have the blue graph. Between negative 4 and 5, the pink. To the right of 5, for x is bigger than 5, we have the y equals 2x. Now, another reason I refer to these numbers here as cut points, just because they work so much like cut points. At cut points, you had to have either an open circle or a closed circle. The same thing's going to be true here. In order to graph this, I'm going to start with the, per the pink one, the blue one first. I'm graphing y equals 3 plus 2x. You've got to plug in the cut point. And you might say, well, wait, it doesn't say equal. We'll take care of that in a moment. To graph these, you start by plugging in the cut point, negative 4. Plug that in for y, and what would we get if I plug a negative 4 in here? We'd have 3, it's going to be minus 8, so negative 5. 
Y'all agree with the negative 5 here? Now, right now, we're going to take care of the fact that it's a cut point. At the cut point, you have either an open or a closed circle. You look up here and decide open because there's not an equal sign. So that gets us one point. You need another point. Ooh. The graphing that right there, but 3 plus, oops, 2x, so there's the one of the graphic. So you start off, you take the cut point, plug it in, get a negative 5, look and see there's not an equal sign, so it's an open circle. Now we need some other number to plug in. Now you can't just choose numbers completely at random. You sort of can, provided you're choosing numbers to the left of negative 4. Don't choose zero or something. You should choose a number to the left of negative four. Give me a number to the left of negative four. Don't go too big because uh, negative five, okay? If I plug a negative five in for x, what would I get if I put a negative five right here? The, yeah, y'all hear negative seven? That's right, two times negative five is negative 10. So we'd have three minus 10 negative 7. This number negative 5 is not a cut point. So the only place you get the open and closed circles is at the cut point. Here there's negative 5 comma negative 7. You're going to graph it with just a dot. A dot will look like a cut, uh, closed circle, however. So you're plotting left 4 down 5. Ooh, I'm going to need to lift this up so y'all can see it. Left four, down five. One, two, three, four, five. Open circle. Then left five, down seven. Dot. A dot looks like a closed circle, doesn't it? And then you connect these. You connect them. I'm connecting the open circle and the dot, and I'm going to continue drawing it on one <coughs> side. Am I going to draw it up like this, or continue drawing it down? Keep in mind, the blue graph should be drawn to the left of negative 4. So down. Something like that. Oh. And, oh wow, that blue graph doesn't really look very blue. Okay. So left 4 down 5, that's the cut point. Left 5 down 7. Now this second point, the left 5 down 7, that depends on the number you had plugged in. If you had plugged in a negative 6 or a negative 7 or a negative 8, or a negative 100, you want to use something real big like a negative 100 because then Oh wow, you're going to have to be moving left 100 and down, some, what, 197? No, you wouldn't use anything. So choose the second number close to that cut point. And we now have a blue graph drawn to the left of negative 4. What are we going to do now? Well, now we're going to draw a pink graph between negative 4 and 5. Okay, we're now going to graph this part. The negative 2x between negative 4 and 5. Well, here, there are two different, there are two cut points here. You don't get a choice in which numbers you plug in. You've got to plug in a negative 4 and a 5. Let's decide right now between open and closed circles for those. Both of them are closed because there's an equal sign on both of them. Close circle, close circle. Okay. Plug in the negative 4 in. What are we getting? Are we getting a 8? Plug in the 5 in. A negative 10? I'm sorry, 5 
Oh, positive negative. 10 or negative 10? Negative 10. Negative 10. I think you were right to begin with. Negative 10. So, let's see. Plot. Left 4 up 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Close circle. Right 5 down 10. Ooh. Right 5 down 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Uh. Let me go ahead and make a note. That was negative 10 and that's positive 8 on the x axis. Now I'm going to connect these two dots. Am I going to keep drawing them or do these have definite starting and stopping points? Well, the pink graph is supposed to be between negative 4 and 5. So would I connect these like this and just stop or do I keep drawing? You stop, okay? The pink graph is only between negative 4 and 5. Oops. Don't keep drawing it. If you keep drawing it and put arrows on it, then uh, it's no longer just between negative 4 and 5. Okay, well, 20 short years. We'll be through. We're now up to doing the purple one. That last piece, graph y equals 2x for x greater than 5. Well, there's only one cut point, 5. You've got to plug the 5 in. Let's go ahead and decide right now. Open or close circle? Open. Then, and we get a 10, right? So right 5, up 10, open circle. Right 5 up 10, open circle. We need another point. So it's up to you. I'll give you a choice. What number should I plug in? A number like 6 or a number like 4? 6. Why 6 and not 4? It's got to be greater than 5. You want this purple graph to be to the right. If you plug the 4 in, your purple graph is no longer to the right of uh, the number 5. You're moving between negative 4 and 5. So I'm going to plug a 6 in. And now make a note. This is just going to be a dot. But a dot will look like a closed circle, won't it? So 12. Right 6. Up. There's 10, 11, 12. So this one's sort of like this blue piece here. I'm going to connect the open circle and the dot. Do I continue drawing it up or do I draw it down or do I just leave it like that? Draw it up. You draw it up. Mm -hmm. The blue graph should be to the right, excuse me, this purple graph should be to the right of the number four. This is some nice, nice graphical analysis. We've graphed y equals 3. Oh, well, it's going to be hard. Mm -hmm. Ooh, nope. There's no way I can get it all on there. Okay, so we're graphing y equals 3 plus 2x for x is less than 4. That's way down here. Okay, so for the x values less than 4, in other words, to the left, excuse me, not less than 4, for x values less than negative 4, in other words, to the left of negative 4, we have the blue graph. We have the pink graph drawn for x is between negative 4 and 5. Move that down so you can see it all. Between negative 4 and 5, we have the pink graph. And then finally, for x is bigger than 5, that would be to the right of 5, we have the purple graph. Now, just like with the graphs that we had for, was it ellipses and hyperbolas? When you print these out, they look so small. But when you're doing it online, you can sort of uh, blow them up. There will be a magnifying glass for each one of them, and it makes it really large so you can tell. But even though it's sort of small, 
maybe you can figure out which one it is, or do I need to magnify it? B. I'll make, it's B. It's B, the one that looks the most like it. Oh, well, if I magnify it like that, I can't show my graph. Let's see. Looking at this. So the middle part, closed circle, down, closed circle. Mm, I'm thinking it's B, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, this was the purple part, the pink part. And again, the way it's printed out, I can't control that. It just prints it so small. Okay. Any questions there? Well, number six is the best problem on here. It's the only one that has three pieces. All the rest of them are just two pieces. So uh, let's do problem number four. Okay, here's another graphing one we're going to do. Problem four. Cover over the graphs. I'm sure y'all do that, right? When you're doing these at home. You don't look at those multiple choice till you've completely done it, okay? Because if you did, you could have figured out B for the previous answer way before you were completely finished, okay? But, uh, and so I'm sort of joking. Okay, let's see. What two colors do I want to use? I think I'm going to use pink for the first one. And blue for the, no, purple for the next, black, black. So I'm going to have a pink graph and a black graph. I'm going to draw my rectangular coordinate system. That's my x-axis and y-axis. And there's only one cut point here. The cut point that I'll label on the x-axis is the number one. So right there. Okay, the number one on the x-axis. And you see, the pattern is so much better doing it with the big three-piece one, okay? That's why we do that one first. But let's see, hmm. We're going to have a pink graph and a black graph. The pink graph, will that be to the left of the number one or to the right? X is less than one. That'd be to the left. I'm wondering if y'all have noticed this. Like over here, if there's just one symbol, then the blue one, look at how it's pointing. Okay? It's pointing to the left. Say it's to the, this one's the one that's to the left of negative 4. This one's pointing to the right. It's to the right of 5. Here, for x is less than 1. The pink graph is going to be to the left of 1. And the black graph, x is bigger than 1. That's going to be to the right. Do the pink one first. You've got to plug in that cut point first. What's the cut point? Well, a one. So when we plug in that one, what do we get? Negative two minus one, negative three. At the cut points, it'll be either an open or closed circle. Which one? Closed. Then, you've got to get another number to plug in. I'll give you a choice. Should I plug a zero in or a two? Two. Mm, let's see. It's got to be less than one. It's going to be zero. The pink graph needs to be to the left of the number one. So a zero, what do we get for the y value then? 
negative 2, and that graph is just going to, or that point, you're just going to put a dot there. The reason I'm mentioning this open, <coughs> closed circles versus dot, the answer choices will show the open and closed circles, but they will not show the dots. And you might say, well, it's hard for me to see those. Yeah, but when you magnify them on, uh, when you, if you click no magnifying glass, which are beyond each of these, you can tell it much easier. Well, this one's open and that's closed or whatever, however it is, okay? If you have bad vision and it's hard to tell, even if you have good vision, it's hard to tell. So, uh, when you see the graph, it's going to show the closed circle at right one, down three, then over zero, down two, this is just a dot, I'll connect these and do what? Do I draw it up? Do I draw it down? Do I just leave it like that? Hmm? The pink graph should be for x's to the left of the number 1. You keep going up. Okay? If I had a ruler, that would look better. You see this little dot, when you look at the answer choices, you're not going to see that dot showing. All you're going to see is closed circle here and then a line. It doesn't really show the dots, but it shows the open and closed circles. Look over here to graph y equals negative 2 plus 2x. x is bigger than 1. You've got to plug the 1 in. If I plug a 1 in, what am I getting there? Is it zero? Negative two plus two? Then I need a that, that's gonna be a open circle. Okay, so right one at zero, open circle. Now I need another number to plug in. It's up to me for this. So I'll give you a choice. Should I plug a two in or a zero? It's got to be a number to the right of 1, a number bigger than 1. So I plug a 2 in, mm, what would we have? We'd have negative 2 plus 2 times 2, negative 2 plus 4 is 2 also. Today I'm thinking of something I haven't thought of in a few years. I think it was 1992. I had a student and we were doing this and he kept getting the wrong numbers. It took me a long time to figure out what the heck he was doing. When we would plug a 1 in, he got 19. When we plugged the 2 in, he got a 20. I was like, what the heck is the student doing? Do y'all see it? It was wrong what he was doing, but do y'all see what he was doing? When he put the 1 there, that became 21. And then negative 2 plus 21, 19. Don't ever do that, okay? Oh. When he put the 2 here, it became 22. So negative 2 plus 22. I was like, oh, wow, what's it finally dawned on me what he was doing? It took me a while, but once it dawned on me, I haven't forgotten it. Dot. So the open circle and the dot. Connect them and... Keep going up, something like that. Now, I'll look at the answer choices. And, oh, well those aren't as hard as I thought they'd be to see. Uh, is it B? Yeah, it looks like B. Do I need to blow it? I can magnify the, there. Uh, oh, but by doing that, you can't see my graph. Yeah, I am thinking it is B, isn't it? I don't think any of the other ones look any more close to it. Anyway. So B. Any questions there? Let's graph one more of these. Mm -hmm. Number three. 
I wonder why some of these print in blue ink and some of them in black ink. Got this. Set up to do. Let me find another sheet of black paper. Mm -hmm. Okay. Graph this piecewise function. I draw my rectangular coordinate system. That's the x, y axis. What number am I going to label on the uh, the x axis? Negative two. Now, one of these pieces is going to be to the left of negative 2 and one of them to the right. Look at how the symbol's pointing. I'll call this the, per the pink one. X minus 1. Look at how it's pointing. Is that going to be to the left of negative 2 or to the right? Do you not want to speak? Left. Oh, wait. Can you all not see them? To the left of negative 2. But x is smaller than negative 2. That would be to the left. The symbol's pointing to the left. So I'm going to have the pink graph, y equals x minus 1, drawn to the left of negative 2. And the purple graph. That's why I'm circling these. I'm just trying to show which color I'm using for each of them. For x is greater than negative 2, that would be to the right. It's sort of pointing to the right. I have y equals negative 3. Got to plug in that cut point, the negative 2, on both of these. So let me go ahead and write that. Okay. Doing the pink one first. You plug in the cut point, and there should be what? A closed circle there? So when I plug a negative 2 in for x, what am I getting? Uh, negative 3? So left 2 down 3. Closed circle. Then you need a number to the left of negative 2. Like a negative 3, okay. Plug a negative 3 in or a negative 4, negative 5. Don't go too far off or else uh, you're going to make your graph wait. Negative 3 minus 1, is that a negative 4? And that's just going to be a dot. So left 3 down four, one, two, three, four, dot. Now how do I connect these? Mm -hmm. So will the second point always just be a dot? Yes. For the outer two? Only in, uh, yes. Only in uh, like that first one that we graphed where you had the between. Okay. Then where you have two uh, cut points. See, like on this one. Uh, you yeah, two different cut points where you start and stop. So, okay, so if, it, if it's not two, then it, the second one's going to be just a dot. Okay. Okay. So now, how do I draw this? Keep going down. Yes. Because the pink graph should be drawn to the left of negative two. Now, this next function piece here, the y equals negative three, that looks a little different because there's not an x value. This is called a constant function because it doesn't matter what. If you come up here and replace every x with negative 2, what are you going to have? Well, there aren't any x's. You're going to have a negative 3. It doesn't matter what the x value is. The y is a negative 3. Right here. If you replace every x with negative uh, 2, you're going to get a negative 3. That's going to be an open, is that an open circle? Yeah. Yeah, open, ooh, 
Well, I'm living in a color world, so I can do what I'm doing right here. The purple is open, the pink is closed. Left two down three. Now we need another number to plug in for X. Should I use, oh, y'all give me a number. It's got to be a number to the right of negative two. Okay, zero or negative one or positive one or positive two. See, it doesn't matter. As long as it's a number to the right of negative two, the y value is going to stay at negative three. That's called a constant function. Over zero, down three, just a dot. Connect. And draw to the right. The graph of constant functions are horizontal lines. Okay. Now, this is a nice way of doing it with the colors here. Okay, the pink is the one that's closed. That's telling me that's the one that has the equal sign. The purple is the one that's open. That doesn't have an equal sign. Well, you know in a black and white world it's not going to be like that. In a black and white world when this is all just one color, instead of showing something like that, if you have an open and a closed circle occurring at the same point, it's just going to show it's closed. So let's look at the answer choices. Which ones have these same shapes, but it's not going to have this fancy open and closed there. It's just going to have a single closed circle. Hmm. Let's see. Is it D? Yeah, it's D. And I'll magnify up there on the screen so you can see a little better what I mean. It doesn't actually show anything other than just a little closed circle there. Okay. But it is D. So the constant functions are always horizontal? A horizontal line. Mm -hmm. So that is the piecewise part of this assignment. This assignment has two different types of functions, the piecewise functions and graphing those piecewise functions. Back in the day, I used to teach a calculus, calculus one a lot. I don't do that. It's been a while anyway. Because of the four-hour course, it doesn't really work with my schedule well. But uh, on day one, I used to be able to tell who's going to be able to make it and who isn't based on who can graph a piecewise function. You couldn't graph a piecewise function. This is some nice graphical analysis here that we're doing. But now for the next topic in this assignment. Something called graphing quadratic functions. Graphing quadratic functions. Well, we've already used that word quadratic this semester. In general, a quadratic expression has an x squared in it. So a quadratic function is in the form f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c. Now, it could also be written with a Y instead of the F of X. But I think most of the homework, we see F of X. Now, the, a quadratic function has as its graph a U-shaped figure called a parabola. And these parabolas open up if A is a positive number and down if A is negative. To uh, graph one of these, the key thing we're going to have to do is find this turning point. Every parabola has a turning point called the vertex. It also has something called the axis. The axis is a vertical line that passes through the parabola and cuts it right in half. Vertical line is called the axis. We have a formula that will help us calculate the vertex. 
It also gives the equation for the axis. So you could call it the vertex formula or the axis formula. And I'll write another formula for you to remember. It's, uh, do you remember the quadratic formula? How does the quadratic formula start? X equals minus, minus B, minus then plus or minus squared, B squared minus 4AC, all over 2A. It's the quadratic formula without any of that plus minus stuff. It's plus minus squared. Just minus B over 2A tells us the X coordinate of the vertex. It's also going to give us the equation for the axis, and we'll see that when we start going through doing some, doing one of these with actual numbers, okay? Now, these parabolas, we're going to introduce the word, the phrase increasing and decreasing. Mathematically, a function is increasing if it's rising from left to right. That from left to right is very significant. And a function is decreasing if it's falling from left to right. The increasing and decreasing changes at the vertex. Like right here, we started here and traced along it from left to right. To the left of this vertex, is this graph increasing or decreasing? Decreasing. decreasing. And if we, once we get to the vertex, we're tracing along from left to right, it starts increasing. Do you all see why I say the from left to right is significant? If we were doing it from right to left, decreasing and then increasing. Increasing and decreasing in math talk is always defined from left to right. So what about over here? If it had been opening up or uh, excuse me, downward, then it starts off doing what? Increasing or decreasing? You're tracing along from left to right. Increasing, increasing and then decreasing. Um, I think that's enough for us to do an example. Oh gosh, there's one of these I needed to do. Okay. Let's do number seven. Seven, eight, nine are all the same problem, just with some slightly different numbers. Okay, so. This is one of those gr problems that has so many pieces, but okay. The first thing it tells us to do is to graph the quadratic function. This one, you're going to have to use those little graphing tools. And the one you're going to choose is the vertical parabola, right there. Sometimes students say, well, why don't these things open left or right? Well, you answered that the last time when we were doing the vertical line test for functions. If you had a parabola opening left or right, would, they be per would it be a function? No. no. So we're only looking at functions Ooh, from here on. So they've got to only open up and down. If they open left or right, it wouldn't be a function. Okay, it wouldn't pass that vertical line test. So to graph these, you choose vertical parabola. And of course, I can't show you that right here on this sheet of paper. So you click there, and it's going to ask you, but it's not going to give you any of this stuff until you do the graphing. It's going to say, OK, what's the vertex? Plot the vertex. So let's calculate the vertex using the little minus b over 2a formula. You go x equals minus b over 2a. Hmm. Well, do you remember how you find A, B, C when you're using the quadratic formula? B is a negative 6. 
and A is the number 1, so we have minus B, negative, negative 6 over 2 times 1. So what are we getting for the X value of that vertex? I'm thinking it's just going to be a 3. Now let's draw a little XY table. Plug a 3 in for X. Hmm, let's see. I'm plugging a 3 in for X. So we'd have 3 squared, which is 9, minus 6 times 3 is 18, plus 12. What are we getting for that? Uh, is it another 3? I'm plugging a 3 in here for X. So we'd have 3 squared, 9, minus 6 times 3. If I were doing this up on the board, I'd pull up the calculator and show y'all. Plus 12, it's 3. Uh, it just had to wind up with the same number here and here, but that's just a coincidence. So you'll click here in the, in the yellow box. You remember the little graphing tools? Yellow box is going to say plot the vertex. So you plot right 3, up 3. Right 3, up 3. 1, 2, 3. And then... It's going to say, okay, you know what? Maybe I should use a bigger piece of Maybe I should do this on just a plain sheet of graph paper. Do I have any graph paper? Mm -hmm. I'm do this. It's this right here. Okay. You graph it at right three, you plot the vertex, right three, up three. So there's the vertex. When you click there, it'll then say, okay, plot one more point. Okay, plot one more point. So that's going to be up to you. Choose some number and plug it in for X. Plot one more point. Like maybe, what would be an easy number to plug in? How about zero? Would it be pretty easy to plug a zero in? Plug one other number in. I'm suggesting a zero. What would we get for Y then? Would it be a 12? Y'all got very quiet very quickly. Okay, you plug the, the, the X chord, the three in for X. We got a three for Y. Then choose some other number and plug in. Over 0, up 12, you plot that point, and when you do that, the little software is going to be so nice, it'll automatically, what, oh, I'm sorry, okay, so over 0, up 12, when you plot that point, it'll automatically do the other half, the other half is just a mirror image, so it'll automatically put in that other part there for you. And let's see. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh, we. If I draw, put here where I was drawing it bigger. Over zero, up 12, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, Do it just on graph paper. When you draw this or plot that, the little tool, there's half of it. It'll then just automatically fill in the other half as just a mirror image. So to graph these, you're plotting the vertex, then one other point. And I can't really show it there, but you have graph these things on uh, assignment 6 you were using that graphing tool also. Now it says, okay, what's the axis? Well, the axis, once you get, get the thing graphed and it says that's right, they'll start asking, okay, what's the axis? Well, the axis is that vertical line there. 
Where is that vertical line passing through the x-axis? At x equals 3. It's the same thing that you got for that vertex formula. That's why I said that this minus b over 2a formula gives you both the x coordinate of the vertex and it also gives you the equation for the axis. Now it starts asking about domain and range. Well, there's a couple of ways to do the domain. With the domain, you can think of the rules we stated the last time. If there's no fractions and no square roots in your equation, what's the domain going to be? All real numbers. You can think of it like that. Or you can just say, okay, well, this thing, if it keeps going and going, Will it eventually span from negative 20 to positive 20 here on this graph? Well, yeah. What if we call this negative 1,000? And way up, excuse me, negative, one, uh, negative infinity and positive infinity? If it just keeps going and going, this thing's going both up and out. Okay? So the domain is all real numbers for any quadratic function. So for every one of these, the domain, you'll write all real numbers. Now the range, that's going to take some thought. And that's why I drew it bigger right here. For the range, the y values are not from negative infinity up to positive infinity. Where do the y values start here? What's the smallest y value on this graph? Three. The range will be from three this thing keeps going up to positive infinity. The range is 3 to positive infinity. I'm taking this y value, and then it's getting bigger and bigger. And then it asks about the increasing and decreasing. Remember, when you talk about increasing and decreasing, you're tracing around from left to right. So it starts off decreasing, and then at the vertex it changes to increasing. Now read the instructions. This is sort of strange. The interval of the domain for which the function is increasing. So you're looking at the x value. On the x-axis, this thing starts increasing here, this 3, and keeps going, and it keeps increasing to the right of 3. So this would be 3, comma, infinity. It's increasing from 3 to infinity on the x-axis. To the left of 3, the graph is increasing. To the right of 3, the graph is decreasing. So the, how do we say to the right of 3? That would be negative infinity, comma, 3. Bracket. We're talking about the numbers here on the x-axis. To the right of 3, the function is increasing. To the left of 3, that would be from negative infinity to 3, the function is decreasing. There's unfortunately a lot of threes going on in here. The worst way possible, having the same three here and here. For the range, when it's stating the range, it was this three I was using. Okay? When we were stating the increasing and decreasing, it's this number, this three. Okay? Now, this is not an application course. This is why I like teaching it. It's an abstract course. But every now and then, we're going to have a few word problems popping up. And it all has to do with if a parabola is opening up. Let me see. Where's that stuff I did? OK. If a parabola is opening up, At the vertex, that's the low point on the vertex, excuse me, on the graph. So this vertex 
would be a minimum value for the function. If a parabola is opening up, its smallest y value occurs at the vertex. Using a word similar to minimum, if a parabola is opening down, then this y coordinate here at the vertex, could y'all think of a word similar to minimum? It even starts with m maximum. You're going to have, I think, three homework problems that deal with uh, finding the minimum or maximum value. And if we look at number 10, it's setting it up for it. Here we have a parabola that's opening up. If it's opening up, then here at the vertex, would y'all say that that's where the maximum value occurs or the minimum? Yeah. Minimum. It says the smallest, the minimum value of f of x is, oh wow, this is going to be the easiest problem we'll do this semester. What's the smallest y value here? <coughs> Which one of these numbers am I going to put inside here? The, po the 5, the positive 5, because it wants to know the smallest Remember, f of x is y. So for everyone's number 10, there's going to be a graph, and it's going to be, if it's opening up, then it'll ask about minimum. If it had been opening down, it'll ask about maximum. Like number 11 is a really good little application problem. Many future economists don't think much about it. I mean, don't think too hard about it, because if you know a little bit about economics and stuff, it doesn't make much sense. Just pretend it's a pro word problem, don't think about it. A woman has a taco stand. She's found that her daily costs are approximated by, and it, is this a quadratic function? Yes, there's an x squared. How is it opening, up or down? What's the number a? It's a positive one. Parabolas open up if A is positive, down if A is negative. So this thing's opening up. And back at problem number 11. So here's a parabola opening up. So the vertex is what? A minimum or a maximum? It's a parabola opening up. The minimum. Okay, so she has, she's found that her daily costs are approximated by this little function where C of X is the cost in dollars to sell X units of tacos. Find the number of units of tacos she should sell to minimize her cost. For all of these word problems, and there's three of them, if you just do the minus B over 2A, you'll get the answer. We have a minus What's B? Negative 20. So on top we have a positive 20 over 2 times A. What would we have on the bottom? So 20 divided by 2, that's 10. So the number of units of taco she should sell is 10. Now what do y'all think we're going to do with this 10 in order to answer the next question? Plug it in, okay? And the word problems, if you just find the minus B over 2A, that should answer it. That, that, you know, and they'll plug it in. Plug the 10 in. Let's see, 10 squared. That would be 100 minus 20 times 10 plus 650. So we have 100 minus 200 plus 650. I know we're out of time. So what would that give us? 100 minus 200 is negative 100 plus 650. $550. So if she sells 10 of units of these tacos, her cost will be $550. These are some pretty lavish tacos. Okay? But then who knows? <laughs> 10 might be an order of 3 or it might be an order of 100. So they can be as lavish or expensive as you want. Okay? 
the other two word problems, I did. I knew I wouldn't have time to do all three of those word problems today. So there's a separate video, and it'll be part of the class lecture, where I'm working out all three of these word problems. 10, 11, 12, 13, if you need any help with them, in addition to the viewing examples. So, one at a time. Sorry, I kept you late. Bye-bye.